Hello, my name is Carolyn Strong, and it is my privilege to welcome you to the 26th annual Spirit Cemetery Tour. Although you cannot come visit my neighbors and I in the traditional way, I am very pleased to welcome you to this serene setting. In a few moments, you will have the opportunity to meet other members of the Three Village community who now reside at the Presbyterian and Caroline Church cemeteries. I was honored when I was asked to speak on the behalf of the Three Village Historical Society, who honored me during last year's tour. I lie here in the Strong Cemetery of Strong's Neck. I was a nurse, a lifelong resident, and a survivor of the 1918 flu pandemic, which lasted two years and came in three waves. So I understand why it is impossible for us to gather this year, but know you are missed and take heart and take heed. During that pandemic, nursing shortages only complicated matters and science was not as advanced as what you experience today. We did not have antibiotics. There was no vaccine. But we did our part. We masked up and we kept our distance. And our dear Doe boys, who I cared for during the war and knitted socks for them, inadvertently spread the virus in their travels. Staying home was instrumental in stopping the spread. I have always been someone who supports a good cause and supporting the society qualifies as such. As it works to keep my story and history alive, the society needs your help to sustain it. We spirits of the cemetery tour generally escort the society into the fundraising season, a position we relish. The funds raised during this period help to fund all of the activities and endeavors throughout the year including next year's Spirit Cemetery Tour and the highly anticipated Candlelight House Tour. The Society wants you to know that they are working diligently on different endeavors, fundraisers, and lectures. Please consider donating to the Three Village Historical Society. I've been told that you can do so online and you can keep up to date on social media and something called email correspondence. You do have quite advanced communications. Now, you are about to enjoy a journey into the society's recent past, the year 2008 to be exact. We will lead into the three villages collective history as told by the individuals who shaped and influenced it. Thank you for visiting me my compatriots, and be well.
Good morning. I remember Eliza Hawkins, Captain Hawkins. The year is 1752. I'm one of the spirits that come back every year. I always look forward to this, to see my own home and my birthplace. My father's buried right over there, Zachariah Hawkins. He was one of the founders of Setauket and the town of Brookhaven in 1666. Unfortunately, he died when I was 11, uh, and I had to uh, join the militia soon after for several years, many years, then I went to sea. Uh, I progressed up, uh, up, eventually became a captain, and had a progression of ships that became bigger and bigger. I must tell you, uh, uh, my most exciting thing was right at the end of my career, and I retired right after, which you'll understand why. Uh, we were coming up from the Carolinas. Uh, sometimes we would go down and pick up cotton and tobacco in Virginia and the Carolinas and the like. We were coming back, and uh, it was dusk, getting dark, uh, off for the Virginia coast, and there was a ship just sitting there, uh, abandoned. We came up alongside it. No, it didn't seem like anybody was aboard. We shouted at them, and uh, nobody appeared. So we laid off until the next morning, and then we pulled up alongside of it and threw out grappling irons and pulled ourselves in and, and went on board. We were all armed because we didn't know what to expect. And the ship was a ghost ship. In those days, uh, that was a term for a ship that was either abandoned or everybody got sick and died or something, something happened. So we went over the, the ship and there was no sign of life at all. It was quite, quite uh, amazing. The only sign of life was in the captain's cabin. At his table was an empty wine glass that was sitting there. And as I was contemplating the wine glass, all of a sudden I heard this uh, blood screeching yell from the, uh, the forward hold. Uh, I and all the rest of my crew ran forward and one of the men had found a cask or a, a, a small uh, uh, trunk, if you will. Uh, obviously it was uh, banded in iron and was quite strong and it must have held something uh, valuable. We were quite excited, everybody. I had some keys and we tried all the keys and finally one of them opened the lock. Uh, and we peered inside and my gosh, uh, it was gold and gold bullion and chain and, and uh, silver ignits. It was ama an amazing uh, amount of money, uh, fortune. So all we could think about was getting back to Setauket. Uh, we abandoned the, the ghost ship and just left it there and sailed back. Um, in those days, it was always uh, uh, the thing that the master of the ship and the owner of the ship got half of the, uh, the proceeds and then it was split up uh, with the rest of the crew. Uh, there was so much uh, gold and bullion and the like that even the lowest cabin boy uh, got a small fortune. So when we got back, we divvied it up and, and uh, went our separate ways. Uh, at that time, here in uh, the colonies, there were no banks, uh, particularly, uh, there were banks in Philadelphia and New York, but not in New York City, not out here, not in, in rural areas. And to have a lot of money or have a lot of uh, silver, things of that sort, was very dangerous because you were, you were uh, prone to be, uh, be preyed upon by thieves. So as soon as I could, I started buying land for my children. I had nine children, and I bought each one a homestead. And they several here in Setauket, in Stony Brook, uh, a couple in Strong's Neck, and several in Riverhead. Uh, consequently, there's Hawkins all over Long Island. As you know, probably those who are living today, there's Hawkins, you see their name mentioned everywhere. Coming to the end of my life, uh, I died in 1772. Uh, there was a lot of ferment here and all over the colonies uh, about our ties with England. I personally had nothing to complain about. I had had a good life, a prosperous life. Of course, I had that great fortune at the end of my life, uh, but I was very interested to see how things turned out. So I do, uh, uh, I'm very interested when I do come back as a spirit to see how this country has grown and changed and prospered. And it makes me proud that I, uh, I was part of it and my, my uh, sons and daughters and grandchildren and other generations uh, have done very well. Uh, life is good.
Good evening, folks. My name is Rachel Holland Hart. As a young girl, I worked for the Strong family, a wonderful family, Judge Strong and his family. Summer days, I would take little Judd, who was 10 at the time, and we would go eel spearing. He loved to eel spear. We would catch up to 20 eels a day. It was a fun thing for Judd on those hot summer days. We also caught flatfish. That was a fish that they all loved. I was painted in the boat with Judd by William Sidney Mount. A beautiful, lasting painting that traveled all over the world. Dinner was served in the hottest part of the day, which was about 12. 12 in the afternoon was dinner. We would have a lot of sweets, mostly strawberry shortcake. Judd and I had so much fun on those days. I would go back to the big house and I would serve and cook meals and have fun each day with Judd and all the other strong children. I was born on Brook Street in Port Jefferson. Along the way, at age 20, I married. I had a wonderful husband. Later on, I remarried again to a wonderful man, and we had four more children. Two of the children survived and two didn't. The two that survived married and were also helpers and servants for the Strong family. I want to tell you about my life with the Strongs. They were um, very caring people and loving people. And I was so happy with them all the years that I worked there with them. So this is just a little bit of my story, folks, and I hope you enjoyed what I have to tell you. Good afternoon. You just caught me thinking about a dear friend, William Sidney Mount. He was such a kind, good-hearted man who did so much to ease the suffering of a broken-hearted woman. Let me explain. My son, Jedediah's grave, is over yonder, and the words that are engraved there are carved into my heart. I can feel them when I breathe. Death could not strike a fatal blow till his great master bid him go. Then, in an unexpected hour, he came and cut the tender flower. Death did come in such an unexpected manner that day. Jedediah was only 14, a fine, obedient lad. I often think, had I insisted he stay home that day, none of this would have happened. After all, there was a frosting of snow on the ground and a bitter cold that cut straight to the bone. But Jedediah was so proud of his work at Mr. Smith's store. It was his first real job, and he had so many plans for the money he was earning. Nothing would keep him away, never mind a little chill in the air. I remember every detail of that day. I wrapped his muffler around him and pulled his wool cap down nice and snug. Oh, he protested, saying I was treating him like a child. He was a working man now. But I was his mother, and I did not want him to catch cold. Colds are so dangerous. The last time he took ill, I spent hours nursing him. I put a hot mustard plaster on his chest to ease his breathing and gave him hot elderberry wine and, of course, chicken soup. He recovered right quickly. He was a strong boy. He was a strong boy. 
On that fateful day, he went straight to work from school. He would make deliveries about the town and carry out orders. I'm told he was taking out Mrs. Floyd's order when it happened. He was carrying a box held high on his shoulder, just like a real man. So he couldn't see the horse and the cart careening down the street. The animal had been frightened, the driver thrown from the cart. The animal was running wildly down the street when he struck my son. First the horse and then the cart crushed his young body to the ground. His friends brought him home to me. He was so still and pale. There was no life left in him. His hat and muffler was still where I placed them earlier that day. We placed him in a coffin in the parlors, was proper. My husband, William, asked William Sidney Mount if he would please come and paint a portrait of our son. He was uncomfortable with the request, but he did so because he was such a dear family friend. It was difficult for him to sit next to the coffin making his sketches, and it seemed like he spent hours there before he bid us good night. And then, a few months into 1837, the portrait was delivered. He had captured my boy, his shining eyes and beautiful smile. He brought my Jedediah home to me. And so if you should happen to see him this afternoon, please thank him again for me. And thank you for sharing in a mother's grief. Good afternoon. John Wiltsey, 1765 to 1815, Long Island shipping pioneer. I understand that my family came from Normandy in France and then went to Holland before finding themselves in New Amsterdam in 1623, one of the first settlers of that colony. I was raised in New Jersey, an orphan, and at the age of 14, I was dispatched to George's Neck to work on the Jacob Van Brunt farm. To think that only 150 years before that, the land was inhabited by the Pokwot Indians. Besides working on the farm, I was very near the water and took an interest in shipbuilding in Setauket Harbour. I married Sarah, Sarah Tyler, and eventually had no less than eight children. Seeing a growing family and seeing that shipbuilding was a promising industry, I looked over the hills of George's Neck to the adjoining land drowned meadow. It really was a drowned meadow, full of mosquitoes, swamps, high tide approaching the hills. But it was perfect for shipbuilding. So I approached the owner, Judge Thomas Strong. Because it was such an inhospitable environment, he literally gave it away for a few dollars. In 1801, I had the good fortune to get the oyster and clamming rights from those good burgers at the town of Brookhaven. Now, it wasn't the food element, but it was the shells that were so profitable. Those shells were used for the, that new invention called a road, and also to build chimney stacks in the great houses of New York, which was booming. And so the good lords of Brookhaven made me commissioner of highways 
for my sins. In 1802, I was able to build a big house. And what I, on the eastern side of the harbour, I believe it's now called the village centre of Port Jefferson, just adjacent to Belterre. A tavern was constructed adjoining the house, a true public house, you could say. And that public house housed my shipbuilders and gave them a good few pints of beer in the evening. In 1807, the good burghers of Brookhaven, again, allowed me to construct a dock. And in 1809, that dock was finished. And that meant that my future was assured. With my profits, I was able to invest in a farm and one of the main products was cordwood, which was in great demand in the big houses of New York, in those great fireplaces. So there was a good trade established between Port Jefferson and New York and back again. One of my promising shipwrights was Richard Mather, and he married my daughter, Irina. In 1811, I was made vestryman of this beautiful church, the Caroline Church. And then, four years later, at the age of 50, I died. Richard Mather took over the shipyards and can you believe it that a year later he died from a shipping accident. Nevertheless the Mather dynasty was established and looking forward into the future in 1836 Drowned Meadow became the village of Port Jefferson. And the shipbuilding industry boomed on the back of the whaling industry. But, like all things, time brings about a change. That change brought in iron hulled boats, it brought in steamships, and then to capital, the railroad came in and took away that vital trade that was being made between Port Jefferson and New York and the need for those boats. But in all, some 300 boats, wooden boats, were constructed in the Port Jefferson yards. Mather Dynasty is still alive, very much alive in this area. Uh, we all know the edifice called the Mather Hospital. And the roots of that hospital can be traced to my shipbuilding business in Port Jefferson. If I was a loyalist against the Patriots, to think that John Wiltsey would have been speaking with an English accent. John Wiltsey, master shipbuilder. Goodbye. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Zachariah Green, and I am the rector of this fine church. Before I tell you something about the church, permit me to tell you a bit of my own life, which as you will see, is closely entwined with the history of the church for over 50 years. I was born in Stafford, Connecticut, in 1760. At age 16, a mere lad, I enlisted in General Washington's Continental Army at Roxbury, Massachusetts. Early in 1776, I helped pull down 
the huge equestrian statue of King George III on Bowling Green in Manhattan. The statue was made of lead and was dispatched to Litchfield, Connecticut, where it was converted into 42,000 Patriot musket balls. On August 22nd, 1777, when I was just 17 years old, I fought in the Battle of Setauket. I had come over by boat from Connecticut with Colonel Parsons and 300 Patriot troops. We landed in Setauket with the express purpose of driving the British out of Setauket. The British had taken our church and made it their headquarters. They tore out the pulpit and the pews and stabled their horses inside the church. In addition, they overturned numerous headstones, gravestones, and used them to fortify the church. Our force was attacking the church and firing at it. The battle raged back and forth. After four hours of intense fighting, with casualties on both sides, Colonel Parsons, fearful that his path of retreat would be cut off by reinforcements of the British from Huntington, he withdrew and sailed back to Connecticut. Neither side could claim a victory. It had really been a draw. I also fought in the battles of White Plains in Westchester and in White Marsh in Pennsylvania. It was during the fighting in White Marsh that I was severely wounded when a musket ball penetrated my left shoulder injuring my collarbone and shattering my left shoulder blade. It took 10 months to recover from these wounds, thus ending my military career. During my convalescence, I felt a call to the ministry. And after I regained my health, I enrolled in a seminary. And upon completion of my studies, was ordained a Presbyterian minister. In 1797, exactly 20 years after fighting in the Battle of Setauket and firing on this church and attacking it, I was installed as the pastor of the Presbyterian Church. The church I inherited was in sad disrepair. It had been struck by lightning. It still bore the scars from the Battle of Setauket. It had been damaged by fire and age had been most unkind to this venerable church building. And so the congregation decided to build the beautiful but simple church you see behind me. I was most proud to preside at the uh, dedication of the new church on May 24, 1812. I served as pastor of the Presbyterian Church for 52 years and was renowned for my compassion and for the eloquence and power of my sermons. I was made pastor emeritus in 1849 and lived to be 98. Quite an old age for those times. In fact, quite an old age for any time. I was curiously famous for having six fingers on each hand, known as polydactylism. And there you have it, a life of service dedicated to God and country. I bid you all an affectionate farewell. Sonny, come on over here. I've been waiting for you. My name's Celia, Celia Sweezy Hawkins. Uh, I lived most of my life down by the mill in Setauket, you know, the one in the park, um, near the post office, that one, yeah. And I was married to Everett Hawkins. He's the last miller. And he and I had two boys, Francis and Stanley. Uh, people around here called him Mill Dam Hawkins. You may have heard of Mill Dam Hawkins. We had to do that because there were so many Dam Hawkins around here. If you didn't tell one from the other, you just said Mr. Hawkins, nobody knew who you were talking about. Well, 
uh, we had two sons. We had Francis and we had um, Stanley, two fine boys. Well, Everett was at the mill and people would come by with their corn to grind, have him grind for them. He would grind it into flour and sift it and he'd sometimes have uh, grits. You know what grits are, you know, like that little crunchy oatmeal before it's cooked. That's like grits. And then the, the stuff, the leftovers, we gave to chickens for feed. And Everett um, did something very smart. He kept 10% for himself. That was for his services. He was one of the original 10 percenters, I guess you could say. And then we would sell that 10% of flour and grits to people at the mill uh, in case they didn't have enough of their own. Life on the farm, on the mill, I, I call it a farm because we had a farm at the mill. Life there was very, very simple. I kept ducks and chickens and geese and I'd sell the eggs to people coming by and I even kept a cow for milk. Milk and butter and buttermilk, very fresh. You, you, you would have loved to taste of that fresh buttermilk. I did something else too. Nobody's watching, right? I want to show you. Today I'm wearing beautiful bloomers. I got, I got all dressed up for you today, but what I used to do is I'd take those burlap sacks, you know, the big ones, and then I'd cut the corners at the bottom and step right into them and pull them up and tie them with a rope. You could do a lot of good with those feed sacks. I used to make shirts for my two boys, Stanley and Francis. I even made curtains. I was very proud of those curtains. You could do a lot with feed sacks, and sometimes I think we ought to have them back again. Now, the local boys used to hang around the farm a lot. They were always looking for something for free. For instance, a couple of eggs lying around. Two in particular, I can tell you about, they still, well, one of them is buried over there. Uh, but the two I remember is Buddy Gerard and Jean Shottlecuck. They would come by and pick up eggs whenever they had a chance, when they didn't think I was looking. And of course, I had my gun, because the rats were always coming around to pick up eggs, too. And so, oh, wait a second, there's a rat. Hold still. I missed. Too bad. Well, the rats and the boys were always coming around, and I have to tell you, I did shoot those boys, but I didn't use buckshot. I used a buckshot for the rats, and I used salt for the boys. And there are some pretty salty young men around here, and that's got more than one meaning. It's from the salt in my gun. Now another thing they used to do was to trap muskrats. Muskrats had really nice silky skins and they would hide them and then they would sell the skins for pin money, they said, you know, for spending money. But we knew different. We knew that they needed that money to put food on the table. I don't know if you ever heard of it. We had something called a depression in the 1930s. You ever hear of that? You know, where, where banks wouldn't lend you money because um, people were out of work and they couldn't pay the interest and the um, mortgages were being foreclosed and you, I hope that never happens to you. It was a pretty hard time. But um, so these boys made as much money as they could however they could do it. Now in 1935, um, it was in the midst of the Depression, people were not bringing corn to the mill, and the mill needed a lot of repairs, and we were patching it up. And suddenly, lo and behold, this man named Ward Melville, have you ever heard of the Melville family? They're, they're known very well around these parts. And Mr. Frank Melville, uh, the older guy, had died, and that was quite sad, of course, but his son, Ward, and um, his wife, Dorothy, and mother, um, Jenny, they decided to make a park right where the mill is, right at the Setauket Mill Pond. And they had a wonderful idea for it, but they wanted us to move. And he said, you know, Everett, Celia, we want to put a special park here. My dad, Frank, died last year. We knew that. And um, we want to put up a memorial park to him, and we want to take the house here and the mill, but we're not going to leave you stranded. We're going to give you, we're going to swap, give you a house on Main Street, that big yellow house set off from the road. It's got a red barn in front of it, and it's almost new, and we'll give it to you if you'll give us the mill and give us your house. So Everett and I shook our heads, and we said, I don't know, we've been living here a long time, got a lot of memories in this house. But we thought and we thought and we said, deal! What a deal! We got that brand new. So thank you, Mr. Melville, very, very much. You know, I just had a thought. 
back in 1937 after Mr. Melville took our property like that and swapped. We had a very cold winter. The ice was really thick and two boys that I knew really well were down there playing. And one of them, little Junie, uh, Junie Lyons, Harry, you'd know him as Harry Lyons. Little Junie, we called him. He fell in the water and went through the ice. And um, Roy Boy Sells, um, William Leroy, right, William Leroy Sells, we call him Roy Boy. He jumped in after his friend and both boys drowned. The funerals for those two boys were the saddest I ever went to. Uh, little Junie buried over in the Presbyterian Church and, and little Roy Boy's over at the AME Bethel Church. And people cried for days. Then the town got together and we decided to put up a memorial plaque for little Roy Boy at the uh, Setauka Church uh, School on the Hill because he tried to save his friend's life. They moved that plaque over to the new Setauka School. And I'll tell you about that right now. Uh, my son Francis, uh, he graduated from the old one on the hill and he went um, to become a Brookhaven town constable. We were very proud of him. And then when World War II started, he joined the Air Corps. And we were also very proud of him for doing that. But then 1944 came. November 26, 1944, he was in a Liberator B-24 bomber, and he had to bail out, and he never made it. It was his 28th mission, and he was supposed to come home just two missions after that, but it was only his body that came back to us. That was so difficult to take. My husband Everett died the following year, and I really think it was partly because of that sadness from our losing Francis. After that, it was just me and, and uh, Stanley at the house, and it was kind of lonely. Then I heard that the school district, the, the, the three villages they call themselves by now, they decided to knock down that old Setauket school on the hill where Francis had been and, and put up a new school on Main Street. And I thought to myself, you know, there's no fitting memorial in this town for my boy Francis. And I've got a lot of land on my farm that backs up right to that Setauket school. I'm going to give them some acres to make a playground in back of the school for the kids, and that'll be in memory of Francis. So whenever those kids go out to play, maybe they'll think of my boy, too. A few years after that, I died, too, in 1957, went to join Everett and Francis up in heaven. And we looked back on our lives here in Setauket, and we thought, you know, it was a simple life, and the people were simple, but it was a good life very different from the times around here now. Good night. Thanks for coming.